certainly don't want to impose on your goodwill, so I'll aim to try to finish as close to 12.15 as I can. I'm sort of amazed at how many people have, have turned up for a conference on John Owen. I mean, I'm interested in him because I get sort of paid to be interested in him, I suppose, but um, <laughs> I, can't, I can't see what's in it for you lot. Uh, that's the, uh, <laughs> the last uh, lecture, I wanted to talk about Christ and the Spirit, and um, I referred uh, way, way back, I think it was in lectures last night, I talked about the fact that the, the Reformers and the Reformed were very Catholic in terms of their understanding of the Trinity. And one of the, the things that they were very uh, clear on was that all actions of God are actions of the Trinitarian God. That every action of each individual person of the Godhead involves the other two persons as well. Uh, one can ascribe different roles to the different persons, but no person in God ever acts independently of the other two. That would give us more than one God at the end of the day. And you'll notice that in, in the discussion of the covenant of redemption, I didn't talk much about the Holy Spirit. And one of the criticisms of the covenant of redemption that's often made is, it doesn't seem to be very Trinitarian. It seems to be talking about the Father and the Son. What about the Spirit? Well, one of the significant contributions that John Owen makes to discussion of the covenant of redemption is that he is one of the first and then one of the most elaborate articulators of the Spirit's role in the covenant of redemption, the covenant of grace. Right from his earliest reference to the covenant of redemption in the 1647, in the death of death, Owen is careful to make sure that the Holy Spirit too is talked about in terms of the terms of the covenant of redemption. <clears throat> the Father uh, agrees to uh, set up this arrangement for the Son. The Son agrees to submit himself to the Father in terms of this arrangement and the Spirit agrees to be one of the agents of the execution of this arrangement, both in terms of Christ himself and in terms of the believers who follow on after Christ. And it's important that, that we grasp that because at the end of the day, as I said last night, Owen is a Christian theologian and Christian theologians deal with the Trinity. If you're a Christian theologian who doesn't deal with the Trinity and doesn't talk about the Trinity, if you're a Christian who doesn't pray in terms of the Trinity, if you're a Christian who doesn't understand their worship in terms of the Trinity, then you're not fully Christian on that level. You're not fully Christian. You need to do justice uh, to it. My slightly distracted by the very sweet baby there, uh, bouncing up and down, having a, probably a better time than you're having listening to me, I'm sure. So, Owen is very, very careful to lay out the role of the Spirit in salvation as well. Now, often we, we jump in and think, well, yeah, we know about the role of the Spirit in salvation. We, uh, we know that the Spirit is the agent of conversion, the Spirit is the agent of sanctification, and the Spirit is the agent of binding us in union to Christ, etc., etc. Well, Owen's understanding of the Spirit is much more sophisticated than that, and it starts with his understanding of the role of the Spirit in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's rooted in his exegesis of the New Testament. For example, it's the Holy Spirit that comes upon the Virgin Mary and leads to the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ. So for Owen, the Holy Spirit is involved in the very act of incarnation. You will remember that after his baptism, we are told, uh, I think it's in Luke's Gospel that the language is very strong, but the Spirit drives Christ out into the wilderness. The Spirit doesn't just take Christ by the hand and lead him out into the wilderness. The emphasis in the biblical text there is on Christ being thrust out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. You had his baptism, the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove. So Owen's primary focus, first and foremost, is on the role of the Spirit in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is where it gets interesting and somewhat complicated. For Owen, Owen says the only direct act of the second person of the Trinity upon the human nature of the Lord Jesus Christ is to bring that human nature into personhood, personal union with himself. Every other act, Owen says, relative to the person of Jesus Christ has to be understood in terms of the activity of the Holy Spirit. Why is that significant? It's significant on two levels. One, it's significant because it allows Owen to give a fully Trinitarian understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ. At no point can Jesus Christ be dealt with independent of the Father and Son. 
whenever there's a famous saying in the, in the ancient church by one of the Cappadocian fathers. Cappadocian fathers were Eastern theologians in the 4th century who had some of the most brilliant insights into the doctrine of the Trinity. And they would say, when it comes to God, every time they think of the three, their mind is drawn to the one. And every time they think of the one, their mind is drawn to the three. The point they're making is, Christians, we can't tie together the threeness and the oneness of God, but we cannot think of the oneness of God without thinking of his threeness, and we cannot think of his threeness without our minds being drawn to his oneness. And in some ways, the Cappadocians are as good as it gets. You're never going to understand the Trinity. The best you can hope for is that every time you think of the God who is one, your mind goes straight off and thinks of the God who is three. And every time you think of the God who is three, your mind is brought back to the God who is one. So for Owen, Jesus Christ, in all of his activity on earth, has to be understood in terms of the activity of the Holy Spirit. The only thing that the second person of the Trinity does directly to the human nature is bringing in into personhood with itself, with himself. So what does the Spirit do? The Spirit is there at conception. The Spirit is the agent by which Christ is conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Secondly, Owen says, the Spirit is the means by which the human person of the mediator uh, receives, if you like, communications from the divine. That the divine and the human are united in the person of Jesus Christ does not mean that everything involved in the divine is immediately communicated to the human. The human nature does not become omniscient. Christ, as a human mediator, is not omniscient because his human nature is united to God. That's impossible. We talked about that last night. Human beings are finite. Christ, as a human being, is finite too. Christ's nature does not become infinite. Christ is not capable, in terms of his human nature, of knowing God infinitely. He's a finite person. He's a perfect person. He's a righteous and sinless person. But Christ cannot know God in his human nature as God knows himself because he's not infinite. That's a big difference between the Reformed and the Lutherans. For the Lutherans, there is a direct communication of divine properties from the the divine nature to the human nature. It's why the Lutherans believe that Christ is humanly present everywhere. He's humanly present in this table here. He's humanly present in the carpet. It's of no saving significance because there's no promise attached to his presence in this table in the same way that there's a promise attached to his presence in the Lord's Supper, for example, or in the preaching of the word. But for the Lutherans, when the human nature joins with the divine, it is transformed. It takes on the properties, the characteristics of the divine. For the Reformed, who want to do justice to the humanity of Christ, the human nature is not absorbed, negated, cancelled out, or transformed into something utterly different by its union with the divine. If the human nature was, it would cease to be a human nature as we understand it, and you would have a Christ who cannot save. For Christ to save, he's got to be fully divine and fully human. And if he's fully human, that means he has to partake of our physical finiteness. Part of the nature of humanity be present in one place at one time. Can't be present everywhere. So uh, Owen argues that the only direct act of the uh, second person of the Trinity on the human nature is bringing the human nature into personhood. A personhood that it enjoys in union with the second person of the Trinity. And that's important for his understanding of knowledge. We talked about this earlier on. I said, when Christ goes into Joseph's uh, carpentry uh, workshop and he sees a plane and he says, Dad, human dad of course, uh, what's that? And Joseph says it's a plane and Christ says, what's it used for? And Joseph said it's used for smoothing down wood. He's asking a genuine question. He's not pretending not to know in order to make himself apparently appear human. It's a finite human being. As far as he has a human nature, the person of the mediator is finite and human and learns things as he goes along. Certain things are communicated to him from his divinity to his humanity. Other things are not. 
Christ learns things. He learns things as you and I learn things. He's not sinful, but if he wants to find the way from Nazareth to Jerusalem, he's probably going to ask somebody in the way. Because that is not something he possesses merely by being in union with the divine. All his human nature possesses by virtue of its union with the divine is personhood. Does not possess any knowledge necessarily beyond that. It also goes down to things like uh, the Garden of Gethsemane for Christ. Someone's treading on very, very um, uh, uh, sacred ground, of course, when one talks about the Garden of Gethsemane, but the reform want to do justice to the fact that there is real agony and real struggle there. The human person of the mediator wrestles spiritually in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's not a joke, it's not a farce, it's not a pretendy play put on for the benefit of people watching. The very fact that the Gospel writer flags up the appearance of an angel indicates that there's real struggle going on there. Yes, the end result is guaranteed. From the moment Christ agrees to come to earth under the terms of the covenant of redemption, the end result is guaranteed, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have to go through endless agony and suffering to get there. When a top marathoner, marathoner enters a marathon race, you can be pretty sure they're going to come in in under two hours and 30 minutes. But they've got to go out and make the running to do it. The very fact that they're superbly conditioned marathoners and nothing can go wrong doesn't guarantee they're going to come in in under two hours and 30 minutes. There is an analogy with Christ there. Yes, the end result is guaranteed because of who Christ is. But he has to really go through these things. And for John Owen, the Spirit is that which helps strengthen Christ. In the covenant of redemption, the Spirit agrees not only to be the agent of conception of Christ, but also to be the agent that strengthens him, that provides him with the gifts necessary to do his ministry. So you see that the whole economy of salvation is profoundly rooted in the Trinitarian life of God in eternity. God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit all have a crucial role in the ministry of Christ upon earth. God the Father is the one who sets up the covenant terms and conditions. Christ the Son is the one who voluntarily submits himself to the will of the Father and agrees to become the federal head of humanity. And God the Holy Spirit is the one who comes in and assists and aids and strengthens and enables Christ under the terms of that covenant to do the work that he's got to do. And it's important we think of it in those terms because that points us directly to the fact that this is a Christian thing that is going on and not a non-Christian thing. I was giving the anecdote, um, not sure, I think I gave you the anecdote last night of the guy who stood up in my class and said, you know, I just teach my people that God the Father came down and died on the cross in Calvary. That is not a Christian economy of salvation. That is not Trinitarian. That is Unitarian. That is God the Father doing it all. The person of Christ, the biblical text speaks of Christ having a relationship to the Father and to the Holy Spirit that requires a differentiation of the three. Yet it also speaks of the three of them being united in the way that salvation is executed. And that has a very practical impact for John Owen because he writes a book, perhaps um, I've said to people the best thing to start with reading John Owen is Volume 6, Mortification of Sin. But I think it's in Volume 2. There is an even better book in some ways to start with and that's on communion with God in three persons. And it's a work of practical piety. It's telling you, if you like, how to pray and to worship. And it's emphasising that worship should be Trinitarian. When you come before God in prayer, when you worship him, you need to take account of the fact that your salvation has been accomplished by a Trinitarian God. And that when you worship God, the whole of salvation is to be ascribed to the whole of God, to the Trinitarian God. But one can also praise the different persons of the Godhead for their different respective roles within that one unified economy of salvation. If you follow Owen's instructions in that book, there's no way somebody could come into your church on a Sunday and mistake it for a Unitarian church. And I have a sneaking suspicion 
that some of our church services are probably not as different to Unitarian services as we'd like to make them out sometimes. When people preach the gospel and never refer to the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit, then there's a problem there. That's not really the gospel at the end of the day. So, the, the role of the Spirit is extremely important in Owen's thinking, uh, theologically for understanding who Christ is, why his work is worth what it is, and how he comes to execute it. And that, in turn, is extremely important for how Christian worship is organised and dispensed, if you like, during the worship service. Worship service should be explicitly Trinitarian. Private devotion should be explicitly Trinitarian, self-consciously Trinitarian. You can tell a lot about people's theology often from the way they pray. Of course, one wants to make a distinction between uh, uh, one can pray correctly in a very, very pharisaical and unworthy manner and one can pray prayers that are basically heretical but out of a genuine simplicity of faith and out of an ignorance, if you like. So one doesn't want to sit in judgment when other people are praying but you can learn a lot about somebody's theology from listening to the way they pray spontaneously. I remember one particularly embarrassing moment when I'd been hectoring the students at Westminster about modalism. And then when I closed the class in prayer, I prayed a modalist prayer. And all the students picked up on it straight away. And it was very embarrassing having told them, you can't approach this God this way. And then I just went ahead and did it. Uh, it says something about the heresy that lurks in all of our hearts, I suppose. Um, but Christian worship, because of the way salvation is, it's Trinitarian, so Christian worship should also be Trinitarian. And I have to say, it's something that the Greek Orthodox churches do much better than the Western Protestant churches. Uh, I went a few years ago to a Greek Orthodox service with some students um, just to show them what a Greek Orthodox service was like and we had a discussion afterwards with the priest and then we sort of debriefed and the students uh, told me what they thought was good about the service and what they found problematic and there was plenty of stuff they found problematic. But one of the strengths was it was clearly Trinitarian from beginning to end. There was no doubt that you were in a Christian theological environment because you're talking about the Trinitarian God right from the word go. And at the end of the service, the priest raised his hands and gave the blessing and said, go in peace for the Trinity has saved you. He was an Eastern Orthodox priest but John Owen could have said that. Go in peace for the Trinity has saved you. It has profound practical importance. So Christ and the Spirit then, very, very important. Next point, the spirit and the believer. The spirit also has the obvious practical importance for us, that it is that which brings God's grace to bear upon the lives of the believer. Owen is very, very clear that human beings are bound under sin. They are incapable in and of themselves of turning to God. Who is the agent of God that works in the created realm? It's the spirit. How does the spirit do it? The spirit transforms your will and your mind. It cleans up your will and it cleans up your intellect and turns you to God. Because your will and your intellect are corrupted, it is impossible for you to do that of your own accord. You're a broken stick and you will always be a broken stick until somebody comes along and mends you. You're a crooked line and nobody can draw a straight line with that other than God himself at the end of the day. The Spirit is the agent that transforms individuals. And Owen is very... Uh, clear. Uh, you, you don't find this so much in the reformers who uh, um, don't talk so much it seems to me about Christian conversion. But Owen is very, very clear about Christian conversion as something that takes place during life on the whole. He himself was converted in one of those typical uh, stories where he goes along to a, a chapel to hear, I think it was Edmund Calamy the great preacher. He was expecting to hear Calamy Calamy can't make it that night. It's some unknown guy whose name Owen forgets. The gospel is preached and Owen is converted under the ministry of this unknown guy. It's one of those great kind of Spurgeonic stories. Remember, Spurgeon's converted under the ministry of a guy who can barely read, I think. Can barely read, certainly can't preach properly, but he can mutter words that contain the gospel and it's enough for God's spirit to use it and apply it to Spurgeon's heart. Same thing happens with Owen. The Spirit is crucial. Now, his paradigm for this is, interestingly enough, St. Augustine. When he talks about conversion, the example of conversion that Owen uses is that of St. Augustine. Augustine, as he sits in the garden and reads the book of Romans, and the Spirit comes and transforms his heart. 
The Spirit is the agent of conversion. What does the Spirit do in conversion? Well, renews the intellect and the will, provides faith for individuals, trust in Christ. How does that save? Well, the Spirit becomes the bond of union between the believer and Jesus Christ so that you can then relate to the Father through Jesus Christ. Even as the Spirit works in conversion, he works Trinitarianly. You can't talk about conversion without thinking of the Trinity. What is the Spirit doing? The Spirit is uniting you to Christ and in Christ you relate to God as your Father. So the federal headship thing kicks in. Remember, I said earlier on in the, in the, the lectures, God really only deals with the human race on the basis of two people. He either deals with you in Adam or he deals with you in Christ. There's a sense in which one could say, it's overstatement, but I'm, I put it this way in order to, to shock you into thinking about it this way. There's a way in which God only really cares about two people. He cares about Adam and he cares about Jesus Christ. And his attitude to you is profoundly shaped by whether you're in Adam or you're in Christ. And the agent of your union with Christ is the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that binds you to Christ and allows you to connect with God as your Father. All your prayers are channeled through Christ to the Father. Why are your prayers effective? Well, for John Owen, your prayers are affected, effective at the end of the day because they're not your prayers. They're the prayers of Christ. You pray in the context of your union with Christ and what God is really hearing is Christ pray, not you pray. And the answer to your prayers is guaranteed because it is Christ who sits and intercedes at the right hand of the Father not because you're praying. And that goes a long way to trying to, you know, you don't need to have an hour in prayer every morning. You know, I think in, in evangelical circles particularly, we bound ourselves into a legalism, certainly that you should pray. You should pray continually. But your prayer life is not affected because of the time you spend on your knees and the physical exertion you put into it. Your prayer life is affected, be, effective because you are in union with Christ and Christ prays to the Father on your behalf. And that's a liberating thing to get hold of, I think. It's an implication of justification at the end of it. It's an implication of the headship of Christ. Your prayers are effective because of Christ, not because of yourself. It is a privilege to pray in the context of union with Christ. At the end of the day, God hears you because he hears your federal head, the Lord Jesus Christ and he hears his prayers. And that's a, a very liberating thing. One could say, that liberates you to pray for an hour then. You can be liberated to pray for a whole hour because you know it doesn't depend on that hour. The strength of your prayers doesn't depend that way. You can do it because you know the success of those prayers in the will of God is guaranteed already. So again, the spirit is the bond of union. It has very, very profound, practical uh, consequences. The agent of sanctification, the Spirit, Holy Spirit is that which makes you holy. Uh, Owen is very clear that only believers, as Owen sees it, really suffer temptation. Only believer can really know the temptation of sin. Why is that? Because only the believer has a new principle of life nurtured and fostered by the Spirit within them. Unbelievers can struggle with sins that they don't want to commit. Not every unbeliever gives in to every temptation. Thank God most unbelievers don't give in to most of the temptations that come every human being's way. Many people who are not believers live more decent and more upright lives than many Christians do. I was struck recently chatting to a colleague who'd been, at, uh, who'd been talking to Jerry Bridges of the pursuit of holiness. And Bridges was saying that um, he'd been to some conference and the hotel manager had told him that they always knew when the Christian conference was at the hotel because the number of people accessing pornographic websites from hotel rooms peaked when the Christian conferences were in town. That's, a bit, that's quite a shocking statistic. And that indicates very clearly that unbelievers quite often live lives of higher moral standards and better decency than many believers do. Yet unbelievers, as far as Owen is concerned, do not suffer temptation in the way that the believers do because at the end of the day there is not this principle of new life striving against the temptation of evil. The Christian life for Owen in some senses is one of 
fairly continual defeat in ourselves. There is a growth in grace, there is a growth in sanctification. But what that means to a large extent is the battle just becomes more and more fierce as life goes on. Because the new principle of life grows stronger and as the new principle of life grows stronger, fostered by the Spirit, so the opposition to that principle goes stronger as well. So the Spirit is the agent of sanctification. The Spirit is also, and this is my final point, trying to close things up as as near to time as I can. Owen has a very strong view of the simplicity of worship. Why does he have a strong view of the simplicity of worship? Simply this. The Holy Spirit binds us to Christ. As individuals and as a church, binds us to Christ. So where does Christian worship really take place? For Owen, Christian worship really takes place at the right hand of God the Father. The worship of God that goes on is, in some ways, the life of the Trinity in the context of the covenant of redemption. The beauty of worship resides in the heavenly tabernacle. And for Owen, the practical result of that is, worship here on earth should be very simple. It should be spartan and simple for this reason. Nothing should be done here on earth that distracts from the beauty of the heavenly tabernacle. That when individuals come into church and when the church gathers, eyes should be drawn away from the earth and directed towards Christ, the author and finish of salvation. The Spirit, if you like, in a strange way, one could say, carries the church up to heaven. And that's where the real beauty of worship takes place. So one of the reasons why Owen is opposed to elaborate liturgies such as the Book of Common Prayer and fancy things going on in church is it distracts. It distracts from the Spirit's main focus in the gathering of worship. And what is the Spirit's main focus there? The Spirit is a spotlight that points to Christ. When you go to a football match or a soccer match uh, in an evening, you don't go to look at... Do you call them floodlights in America? Is that what they call them? Yeah, the floodlights back home. You know, the lights that light up the stadium. You don't go and come away from the match and say, wow, the floodlights were great. <laughs> really wonderful. I, mean, you know, I just want to talk about the floodlights and focus on the floodlights. Uh, no, when you're out there, you don't look at the floodlights, partly because it would damage your eyes, of course, but partly because you've paid good money for the ticket. You go there to watch the match. But if you switch the lights off, you can't see the match. Your evening of entertainment is entirely destroyed because the floodlights aren't operating. And for Owen, the function of the Spirit in worship is akin to that. What does the Spirit do when the church gathers? The Spirit illuminates Christ. It directs eyes away from the earthly arena and towards the heavenly tabernacle. When you read Owen on worship, he will use the language of beauty a lot. The worship is a beautiful thing. Why is it beautiful? Because the crucified Christ sits at the right hand of the Father, making continual intercession. The tabernacle, the temple of Christ's body, is continually before the Father, presenting his wounds and interceding on behalf of his people. And the Spirit directs us to that. So spiritual worship will be marked by a striving here on earth to avoid anything that distracts from that heavenly focus. It's one of the reasons why Owen is a Puritan. One of the reasons why Owen wants worship stripped down to the bare minimum. Well, one of the reasons is he doesn't want the government telling him what he can and can't do in the church. The government can't tell him to do anything that Scripture doesn't require of him. That's the government imposing its will where Scripture has set boundaries. But another reason is He doesn't want anything to distract from the beauty of Christ in heavenly places. And the Spirit as the bond of union acts as a floodlight. And if you like, and put it crudely, Owen doesn't want antics going on on the bleachers that are distracting people from watching the match going on on the field. The purpose of the floodlights is not to light up the bleachers. It's not so you can see the clown behind you with one of those giant fingers going like that every time they score or something. That's not the point of going there. I must admit, American, in Britain, when you go to a sports game, you go to watch, you go to cheer, you go to boo, 
some people get a fight if they lose, but essentially it's not about entertainment, it's about winning and losing, and people take it very seriously. Here, I love going to American sports games because it's all about entertainment. I, I took my mum to a hockey match a couple of years ago, she loved it, she loved the fights on the, on the ice rink, so she couldn't believe that, that this was allowed. And all of the kind of whiz-bangs that went off, she sat for an hour and a half with tears just rolling down her cheeks, wondering what, on the, what, you know, what kind of country is my son moved to where, <laughs> where this is what sports games look like. But you don't go for the antics, or you shouldn't go for the antics. You go to see what's going on down on the pitch. And the point of the Spirit for Luther, the way it impacts upon worship is it directs our minds back to the Trinitarian focus of our lives, to Christ at the right hand of the Father and Christ as our approach to God the Father. And nothing that happens in the worship service should be such that it distracts from that heavenly focus. It's quarter past and I pretty much said much I want to say. Maybe I'll just take five minutes for a few questions and then close the conference. I'm conscious of overimposing on your, your patience, but... Any comments or questions on, on anything I've said? <coughs> sure. In terms of who's in, embraced in it? Um, I guess so. um, there are strong tendencies in Owen's thinking on the covenant of grace to restrict it just to Christ and his elect. Owen is a Peter Baptist, but there is a lot in Owen's thinking that I think pushes in a Baptistic direction. For Owen, the visible manifestation of the covenant of grace is not entirely clearly worked out in terms of, of children being embraced. As I read him, it's not an area I've looked at in great detail, but I see tendencies in Owen's ecclesiology and his understanding of the covenants that push him in a Baptistic direction. If that's, if that's what you're getting at on that issue, is that, was that what you were thinking of? Or? I have a number of Baptist students at Westminster who love to do papers on Owen because the, and the topic they always choose is um, basically it's why Truman should be a Baptist because he likes John Owen and Owen's pointing strongly in that direction. That's the kind of the burden of their of their agenda. Um. <laughs> he was, he starts as a Presbyterian and around about 1642-1643 he moves in a congregational direction. He reads a book by John Cotton who of course came to New England. Um, he reads a book by Cotton, The Keys of the Kingdom and is persuaded of congregational polity. Now, his view of independency, I think, is slightly different from the independency that one often finds today, and that is Owen had a very strong view of the eldership, that there were a plurality of elders and there was to be a strong eldership, and he also believed in a, in a kind of informal connectionalism, that independent churches could gather together for synods, not to have a kind of presbyterial or synodical oversight over each other, but to gather together for advice, that if one pastor is struggling with a particular issue in his church, he can call on the advice of other pastors, call a synod and get some advice and guidance from them. Their advice will not be binding in any way. Um, so, it was a strong view of the eldership and uh, had some connection elements. The nearest thing I've come across it in America and, um, is the kind of thing being articulated by guys like Mark Dever of Nine Marks Ministry. Mark is minister of Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington. And Mark uh, has a view of church government that I think is very close to, to John Owen's. Um, uh, so it's not independency as many of us, my, my own experience of independency was either you ended up with very manipulative elders or you ended up with lowest common denominator, almost anarchy in the congregation. It's, it's a much more, it correlates much more closely with those occasional churches you find in America, the kind of independent Presbyterian churches. It, it fits more closely with that kind of polity. But of course the move to independency for Owen is also a political one. Being an independent in the 1640s also marks you out as politically more radical. The Presbyterians prosecute the civil war because they want a constitutional monarchy. The independents on the whole prosecute the war because they want a republic. So, Owen's move is not entirely uh, 
uh, it's not sim- I mean, there is no such thing in the 17th century as just a theological move because theology is politics and politics is theology. It's also a move on his understanding of how England should be governed. Sorry? Um, well, he, did, he, he thought the Erastian settlement basically involved... Erastianism was a, is, a, is essentially where the head of state is also head of the church. He thought Erastianism was fundamentally uh, flawed as an ideology. Um, he also didn't like the idea that uh, church discipline... Well, part of his objection to Erastian, didn't like the idea that church discipline resided in any way in the hands of the civil magistrate. He also had a view of... Uh, religious, what we might call religious toleration that was quite progressive for its time in that Owen was very much of the opinion uh, he took his sort of independent logic to its conclusion and said well the church is to formulate its own discipline and that requires the state to do no more than uphold the most minimal form of Christianity if you're Trinitarian and you're not a Roman Catholic you should be tolerated by the state and churches should be allowed to organise themselves on lines as loose or as strict as they want within that basic framework by the state. That was never going to happen under the monarchy. The monarchy really used Christianity as a, forms of so, as a form of social control and could therefore never, never get rid of... Uh, you, you've got to get rid of the monarchy in order to free up Christianity for that kind of church polity. Um, and while I haven't looked at it in detail, I'm sure there'd be some eschatological dimensions to his convictions about the monarchy as well. Uh, the execution of the king, if anything looks like an eschatological event in England in the 17th century, it's got to be the execution of the king. That's huge. How would you suggest reading all that? I know you mentioned it first, I'm sure I would probably be volume Yep. I think probably the communion with God in three persons would be a good one to look at. Um, I think if... Uh, a lot of it's fairly technical stuff. I think if, uh, if you want the, the sort of the bones of his arguments, then the various abridgments that have been done are quite good. I mean, not many people have the time to sit down and wade through 600 pages. But the Banner of Truth abridgments, on the one level, they're not Owen because they, they cut out an awful lot of the sophisticated stuff, which is very important to what he's saying. But on the other hand... It's, they're better than nothing and they give you the conclusions if they don't give you all of the arguments, if you like. But uh, volume six, I would suggest. I would also suggest, um, for example, if you want to get to grips with his view of the atonement, you're going to have to read The Death of Death. Best way to get at that would be to buy the, the, the one volume edition of The Death of Death that the Banner of Truth did, which has an excellent introduction by James Packer. Where Packer, I mean, I get the impression that most people have bought that book and probably read Packer's introduction, started reading Owen and then decided, well, I read Packer's introduction. <laughs> I, I basically know what he says. Uh, it's a long and fairly complicated work. But Packer's a good way of getting into Owen. I mean, I would flag up knowing God. If, if you really want to get the overall framework that Owen's operating with, read knowing God and then go and read John Owen and the bits of John Owen that Packer cites there. He's difficult. Um, I think he's the kind of thing that I would certainly recommend that anybody who's an elder or pastor should wrestle with him. It may well be that members of congregations, there are more important people for them to read and to grapple with. But I think church leaders should at least have read uh, Mortification of Sin and um, Communion with God in Three Persons. I think pastors are paid to teach people. So it's important that they, you know, the congregations are busy, they're out earning the money that pays the pastor's salary. So the pastor has an obligation to read Owen and try to translate it into forms that, that his people can understand, I think. So the pressure's, the pressure's more on you than it is on these guys to, to get to grips with it. So. Yep. 
No, I, I, I think you may be confusing Jim Packer with John Stott there. As far as I understand it, Jim Packer's on record as opposing sort of John Stott's conditional immortality views. I've not read anything by Packer that implies that he, he shifted that position. Um, I, mean, I was going to say to you, I think John Owen's views are very similar to Jim Packer's views, is how, how I would have answered that question. Um, as far as I know, Owen stands four square with the orthodox position that it is eternal exclusion from God and that does not involve a disappearing into non-existence. However difficult it is to, to get our minds around the, the biblical language of eternal punishment, however difficult it is to get our minds around the idea of existing yet being excluded from the presence of God, Owen, I think, believes that hell is a place of conscious eternal torment. Um, his views of heaven are quite interesting and they connect again uh, with the Middle Ages and when you go to heaven, what happens there? Well, Owen thinks that heaven, you know God. You gaze upon God. Well, how do you do that? Because in heaven, you have a resurrection body. You're still finite. You haven't become God. You haven't been absorbed into God. So, Owen, following medieval thinkers, thinks that heaven is gazing upon and worshipping the resurrected humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in eternity, we will only know God in and through the incarnate Jesus Christ. The incarnation retains its importance after the final judgment. Because even then, we re- we're, we're perfected, but we remain finite. We can only know God through, um, through Jesus Christ. But I, to go back to Packer, I'd be very surprised if Packer has shifted his views because he went very strongly after John Stott fairly recently on that. Um, couple, last couple of years. Um, No, as far as I know, Jim Packer has always been, as we were saying, sound as a pound on, on hell. Um, oh, no, no. I mean, that, that view has been associated with John Stott. I have to confess, I've never read anything by Stott where he explicitly says that. Um, but that view is commonly associated with John Stott. But Jim Packer has explicitly distanced himself from, from John Stott on that. Um, yeah, I, th- I, think, I think Stott would be the one. But as I, say, I haven't personally read anything by Stott that indicates he holds that view, but it seems to be widespread conviction that he does. Um, Not a lot is my answer to that. I mean, I, I find myself pretty much in agreement with, with the exception of his ecclesiology. I find myself pretty much in agreement with much of what he does. I think his work improves as time goes on. I think display of Arminianism is... is, is uh, that's the very first book he writes, 1643. I think that's a flawed work in some ways, partly because I think he misrepresents his opponents he very much, uh, well, what he does is he blurs the line between Arminianism and Sassinianism. And the line is not a tight one between the two, but there is a difference between Arminians and Sassinians. He blurs the line between Arminians and Sassinians and then imputes all kinds of Sassinian views to the Arminians and trashes them on that basis. And I think that that is not entirely accurate representation of their views. Um, I think in that work as well, he is more dependent upon philosophical arguments often than he is upon exegetical arguments. Not that many of his philosophical arguments are not good philosophical arguments, but as time goes on and his work improves, he engages in more and more exegesis, which I think is, is, is important and useful. But on the whole, I found him a very good guide theologically and I found him a good example to try to, to emulate as well. Um, so there's not a lot I would criticise in him. Um, 
I suppose partly I'm driven by the fact that I think the problem in the church today is not that people aren't critical enough of guys like John Owen, it's that they're too critical of guys like John Owen. So it's okay for somebody like me to be overacting, overreacting in the other way, somewhat. But on the whole, I think he's a pretty sound, pretty sound guide. There's sort of rumours I've seen circulating that he has a, uh, a heterodox view of future justification. And uh, you know, that was one thing I looked into when I heard this. And certainly not. He believes that future justification is a declaration, public declaration on the day of judgment. But it's not, we're not justified now on the basis of some future declaration. We are declared righteous now. It may be hidden from the world. But justification is not on the basis of sanctification in John Owen, which I felt was part of the agenda of this critique. I think that involves a a reading back into Owen of views that simply weren't there. His position is entirely consistent, it seems to me, with the the Westminster catechisms on that. So there's not a lot to criticise, I don't think. But then I'm basically in sympathy with his position, so you sort of expect me to say that. Um, well, he, he's involved in 1658 in drawing up what's called the Savoy Declaration. And the Savoy Declaration is the kind of the independence confession of faith. And w- a good way of getting at that question is to compare the Savoy Declaration with the Westminster Confession because an awful lot of the Westminster Confession is picked up verbatim by the Savoy Declaration. The key differences are um, church government, which is independent in the Savoy Declaration, um, church-state relations, the, the role of the magistrate is... You know, the Westminster Confession in its British version is arguably uh, an establishment principle kind of document and, he, and the, the independents reject that. And the third big point of difference is the section on justification where it's very, very explicit that it's the active and... Pa- and the language of active and passive righteousness both imputed is used in the Savoy Declaration. Now, I don't think that represents a a basic deviation from the Westminster Confession. I think that represents a dramatic clarification of what the majority of Westminster divines intended by the Westminster Confession. So those would be the three big points. But on the whole, very little difference between uh, Owen and the Westminster divines. When you think that people like Thomas Goodwin, who were good personal friends of John Owen and uh, was also involved in, in, in Savoy, people like Goodwin were involved it's not surprising there's not a lot of difference between them. With his uh, covenant uh, thinking, uh, how did he relate that to practical issues, marriage and I don't know if he ever addressed it, addresses those kind of issues. Um, the one, he had, I think he had 10 or 11, 12 children, I can't remember exactly how many, only one child of whom reached adulthood. And she got married and then left her husband and returned home. And then predece- I think he, she predeceased him. So he had first-hand experience of a broken marriage in his own family, but exactly what his own attitude or reaction to that was, I don't know. Um, I don't know that he addresses those issues. Oh, thanks for, thanks for having me. Thank <clears throat> you.